Hi guys. Here we are with chapter four, consumer perception. Uh, perception is this idea that uh, we all organize things in our own way based on our past experiences um, and also things that we've been taught. So it's important, um, and generally speaking, consumers act on their perceptions, not things that are objective. Remember we talked about objectivity versus subjectivity. Perception is very subjective. So anyway, so since consumers act on the basis of their perceptions, not, not objective reality, um, it's important that marketers understand perception and the um, concepts and also how it influences consumers to buy. Okay, so uh, perception is the process by which individuals select, organize, and interpret stimuli, things come into them, in a meaningful and coherent way. A co co meaningful and coherent picture of the world, it can be described as how we see the world around us. So it's basically how we perceive things and how we organize things and interpret things again, based on um, personal experience and social learning. Social learning are things we learn from other people. Okay, so let's talk about a couple of, um, of uh, uh, terms here. Sensation, there's the stimuli, which, there's, which caps, cap, what is captured by the senses, hear, sound, I'm sorry, just listen to me. Um, sight, sound, touch, smell, that kind of thing. So what is it, the stimuli that's taken, being taken in by the sensors? And uh, marketers really work on work play on that because certain smells and certain sounds and certain visions and that kind of thing the way certain things touch remind us of um, stimulate us in some way and remind us of something. So let's just take a look. There's a, a um, chart here. It's in the book, but different ways that companies use sensory um, input. So there's the snap or the pop when you open up a snap container. Um, Jetta, Volkswagen Jetta has that thump of the car door. It's the idea that there's quality to it. Um, uh, spray bottles, um, we can say that that's, that's um, the bottle of the spray bottle indistinguishable. So I see it as it's something that's quiet. And so I see it as something more quality as opposed to sort of those like the more generic spray bottles. I don't know if you're familiar with method. It's a, it's a, um, supposedly, you know, organic or nature friendly product. Anyway, so they use different, uh, you know, the sound of a zipper, um, the, the touch of a fabric, that kind of thing. Change your perceptions. Okay, so <clears throat> the, um, there's this whole thing called uh, um, the differential, the absolute threshold and the differential threshold. So um, the just notice JND is a just noticeable difference. So um, the lowest level that someone's going to be able to experience a sensation is called the absolute threshold. So it's the idea that someone can detect the difference between something and nothing. That's the absolute threshold for a stimulus. So actually recognizing something. So the minimal difference that can be detected between two similar stimuli is called the differential threshold or the just noticeable threshold. So um, uh, they have here a picture of Betty Crocker, Betty Crocker through the ages and how has she changed. So it's sort of like, if you look at the first one, there's eight of them there. If you look at the first one versus the fourth one, there's a great difference. If you look between the first one and the second one, not that much of a difference really. You know, you can sort of judge for yourself. The other thing too is that how is, how do these pictures of these women that they depict, um, how does it fit into the times? So, you know, the, the last one is very contemporary, whereas you know, if we had looked at, say, the fifth one in the 60s, we wouldn't have thought that much of it. So it's that, what is it? What is our threshold? What is it that we notice? Okay, and this is the idea of perception because people's perceptions will change. Um, so absolute threshold, lowest level that it's experienced a sensation. And sensory adaptation is getting used to something that's becoming so accommodated to the stimuli, stimulation that you can't really notice something and notice anything different about it. So for example, the loudness of music in an ad. You know, in the beginning, you know, music's or, uh, loudness of sound in an ad, it used to be that those were not necessarily, we didn't really notice that. It's slowly that's been introduced to us. Or, um, you, you know, the use of animation in an ad or whatever. It's, it's slow, it's like kind of, you know, this little series of little steps. Or it could be whap, a big step, and so it makes us take notice. Okay, ambush marketing is this idea about placing ads where consumers um, might not necessarily expect to see them. Um, you know, uh, in the beginning, for example, on the sides of buses. Um, 
or you know that would, would be never you know back back in the day there was no nothing on the side of a bus or um on the you know even when you go to a sporting event again initially there were no ads in sporting event arenas and now you know they're full of them so it's ambush marketing is throwing something at someone that you when you don't expect it okay experiential marketing um so it's this idea that you can have some sort of experience or interaction with people, uh, with the ad itself or with the, with the, um, with the marketing itself, with the offering itself. So, you know, for example, when um, uh, perhaps an uh, advertiser um, will actually give someone the opportunity to interact with the, with the product. So it, couldn't have, it might even be an aspirational product. So, you know, looking at a, a car in a shopping mall or um, in the middle of Times Square, or something like that. So the people have the experience. Okay, so there is this idea of um, uh, Ernest Weber. We like to talk about, as we talked, said earlier, this is a um, consumer behavior is a multi-disciplinary um, uh, field, and one of them is the strong and like social the social sciences, psychology, sociology. So we're going to talk about theories from time to time. Ernst Weber um, and the just noticeable difference we talked about a couple of slides ago was this idea that um, the stronger the initial stimulus, the greater the additional additional intensity is needed for the next um, uh, for the for something to make a difference. So perceived as different. So it's this idea of everything is relative. So you talk about pricing, for example. If there's a small pricing jump, say let's say cereal goes from 279 to 289. Yeah, it's $10. It's 10 cents more, not that big of a difference. But if it had gone from 279 to 369, that would be a big difference. But marketers might plan over time to eventually, maybe over the course of 18 months, to raise that price. Um, but people, you don't notice it as much because they're sort of slowly, slowly moving it in. So it's the idea of relativity and also this idea of a uh, I like to refer to as series, a series of little yeses. Okay, subliminal perception. There's all sorts of studies about subliminal advertising and subliminal perception. You know, if they, you know, at the movie theater, if they quickly, during the previews, quickly flash um, pictures of popcorn and soda in front of you, are you more likely to buy it? And it's certainly, a ha you know, something happens, it's this liminin, that's this subliminal you know, if they, if the grocery store with you're going through when they're perhaps, you know, saying words and be, you know, quickly saying words in between songs that you, you subliminally, subliminally hear it, but you don't consciously hear it, does it, you know, will it make a difference? And, you know, it's certainly a theory. It's something to talk about. It's worth discussing. There's no um, evidence that subliminal advertising persuades people to buy goods or services, but it's certainly something to be aware of. Okay. So let's talk about stimuli for a little bit. Think about what your day has been like so far. Um, have you seen any, have you had any marketing stimulus, marketing stimulus around you or any other kind of thing? Have you seen a billboard? Have you seen an ad? Have you listened to an ad? Have you looked at an ad in a magazine or, you know, and back page of a newspaper? So, or other stimuli, a sound outside. Like what, think about, try to think for yourself in terms of, I mean, not think for, I mean, not think for yourself, but think about your own, think about yourself and your own personal experiences um, in terms of what is it that you respond to. It's just something to think about. Okay, so let's talk about, um, about uh, expectations. So expectations, um, people usually see what they expect to see. And, we, the, you know, the mind is a very powerful thing. So, um, what what they usually expect what they usually expect to see is based on familiarity, previous experience, or a preconditioned set of expectations. So, in a marketing context, um, a person tends to perceive products and product attributes according to his or her her own expect. Sorry, let me repeat that. Um, in a uh, marketing context, a person tends to perceive products and product attributes according to their own expectations. So there are so expectations is the first thing. Motives. Um, people tend to perceive the things they need or want, and the stronger the need, the greater the tendency to ignore unrelated stimuli in the environment. So if you're really, really, really hungry, you're probably not going to pay attention to the price or to the potential quality. Or if you, you know, really want that new pair of boots because everybody else has them, you might not 
you might ignore the fact that the poor quality or that they don't, it's not the right color, but you, you're ready to take it. So what's your motive? Why are you buying it? So consumer selection of stimuli from the environment is based on the interaction of expectations and motives. So um, with the stimulus itself. So from a consequence of that, you have this idea of selective exposure or selective perception. Um, so when people tune out messages that they find, um, uh, they might find pleasant or unpleasant, um, or with which they're, they, you know, people, people, will, people listen to what they want to, or people hear what they want to, people see what they want, and they'll discount the other thing. So this idea of selective perception, they, um, or that they'll, they'll look at things in terms of to support their own position. We said something we see in politics all the time. So you'll only, you know, you ignore the bad stuff and you'll just look at the good stuff. Or if you're trying to, um, the opposite could be true. If you're just trying to find fault in something, then you'll ignore all the good things and just look at the bad things. So selective perception is very, very important. That it's this idea about, you know, we, we ex do what we expect. We, you know, we have this preconceived idea and we look for those things. Or we have a, we have a notion that we want to see fulfilled and so we ignore everything else. Okay, so there's all this idea about, um, there's gestalt, it's just gestalt psychology. It's this idea that about context. It also goes back to this whole idea of relativity. And we talked about relativity before. Um, and uh, gestalt, psych gestalt psychology suggests that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts and looks at patterns and configurations that affect the interpretation of information. So um, we talked about three different things, figure and ground, which is the context, Grouping, what is it that's together? You know, we try to group things together so they make sense. We put people together that make sense. We put objects together that make sense. You know, bacon and eggs. We don't think about, you know, bacon and cauliflower, for example. Um, and then there's this whole idea of closure. It's this idea that we want to be able to take those things and um, come to some sort of conclusion. So we want to have some sort of image or we want to have some sort of complete image. It's the idea of of gestalt psychology, so that we organize everything in a way that makes sense to us, and it's based on you know this whole idea of what is the context, what's going on at the moment. Okay, so perceptual interpretation. There are um, there are a variety of things that we can talk about. If you ever take organizational behavior, we talk about this in great detail. Um, stereotyping is this idea of that you take a um, uh, Characteristic of one person of a group and apply it to all members of the group. Women are bad drivers. I will say that because I'm a woman. Blondes are dumb. I can say that too. I'm blonde. That's not true. I'm not dumb and I am a good driver. So, but, but yet people put these things into groupings. Um, you know, all children are loud. Well, that's not true. So stereotyping. All things made in China, you know, are poor quality. All things made in Europe are too expensive. Um, you know, things made in Mexico might have, you know, unhealthy parts to them or something like that. So anyway, that's the idea of stereotyping. And then, um, there are a variety of other things that are going to influence, um, perceptual interpretation. You know, certainly physical appearance of something, um, uh, actually what it looks like. You know, they talk a lot about, um, produce, that they only sell, you know, good looking produce in the, in the stores because, you know, people don't want you know, carrots that might have a little hook on the side. Well, it's just as good, but we have this idea of what a carrot looks like. We have an idea about what a car looks like. We have an idea about, um, you know, what clothing should be like. Uh, so anyway, so this is the idea. What, what is it that triggers things? Um, so also descriptive terms. We talk about, you know, what, what's our quick first impression about things? You know, we, we all have immediate first impressions about something. And then halo effect is this idea that um, the, it's the overall evaluation of object that's based on just one or a few dimensions. So for example, it could be um, you know, brand loyalty. Well, if it's a, you know, a Kellogg cereal, it must be good. Or if it's, um, if it's a Honda, it must be a good car, that kind of thing. Halo effect is, is as I said, taking one attribute of one product and applying it to all of the others. Okay, brand image certainly plays a big role in perception. Um, how we position a product, uh, um, what the brand, you know, how what the what the brand image is. So, the desired outcome of um, effective positioning is a distinct position or image that a brand occupies in the consumer's mind. This like sort of like mental position that we have 
has to be unique and represent the core benefit of the, the brand provides. So there's different, different, we talked, we've talked about position. We looked at the positioning map last time. And um, so sometimes, so, so once we have this position of the brand, so um, let's see, what would be a good thing to, uh, BMW cars, for example. Or you could even take, you know, maybe we should take a different brand. We'll talk about Honda, that Honda maybe had a, you know, high quality, low cost, but now when they, they repositioned a little bit when they introduced the Acura. So you rep you you it change the image of the, you update the image, or it could be, you know, the kind of person that drives the car. Buick, for example, is doing that right now that, you know, it's, or your Oldsmobile, it's not your father's old, Oldsmobile, but now Buick is doing that too, that instead of it being like an old person's car, they see, you know, they are updating this image by having younger people in ads and doing fun, sporty things and, you know, out in the town and all that kind of stuff. So um, this is the idea of changing the image, changing what the, uh, the quote unquote, the whole package of the image is, this, what's the image of the service, that kind of thing. So you can see here, um, we talked, there's a couple of different detergent brands with the, with the, um, with the images. You can just read through those. Okay. And perceived price too. Again, we talked a little bit about that when we were talking about the changing of, of prices. Um, so the people get an unex there's a nice little flow chart there. Um, perceived price is the customer's view of the value that they're going to receive from the purchase, and how the cust how customer perceives price is high, low, fair. Gen generally tends to influence the purchase intentions and the post purchase satisfaction. So if you feel like you pay too much for something, you're not going to be very satisfied. But if you feel like you got a bargain, hey, you know anything the product does is good with you because you got such a good deal on it, right? So reference price. Um, also is this idea that, uh, um, uses, it's a, it's the comparison, the basis for comparison in judging other prices. So reference prices can be external or internal. Internal reference prices are those prices or price ranges, um, that you know from memory and external, of course, is the one that you're seeing in front of you. So perceived price is just a little flow chart. Um, they, there's essentially, you know, there's a couple different ways you could go with it. They encounter the high price. Um, so uh, dissonance, which is this idea of, um, you know, dissatisfaction or a break. So they use essentially one, three different methods and um, to decide whether or not they uh, to, are going to buy the product. Okay, so let's talk about quality. Quality is also um, something that people talk about a lot, which certainly was important to mention. Um, so we talk about intrinsic cues, which are the, pro the product itself, size, color, flavor, aroma, that kind of thing. Um, uh, extrinsic cues are things that, so, okay, I'm sorry, inter so inter intrinsic cues, let me, I'm sorry to go back there. Um, uh, intrinsic cues, uh, they somehow it helps people to justify their product decisions as being rational or objective choices. So these things that we remember, but uh, oftentimes that consumers use extrinsic cues that's, uh, generally speaking, characteristics that aren't inherent in the product, like color, packaging, brand image, that kind of thing, to judge the quality. So intrinsic cues are things that we think about for our, in terms of ourselves. Um, and uh, but extrinsic cues are things we look at from the outside. You know, is the packaging so on the on that uh, laundry detergent, for example? Well, you know, it seems to be well made and it has that nice little pore spout, that kind of thing. Okay, so we also think about. Um, uh, quality. This kind of the, all of these things kind of go into sometimes with the augmented image. Um, what kind of quality do they have with service? Um, is there a relationship between the price and the quality itself? What's the image of the store that you're shopping it at? Shopping in that's really important. Um, you know, people who have a different. You know, you might buy the same item at Big Lots that you buy at uh, Target. For, for some, you know, Target has a better store image, so you feel a little bit better about it. Um, what's the manufacturing image or the manufacturer's image or the brand image, that kind of thing. Okay, so moving on from quality naturally calls us into this whole idea of risk. And we talk about risk um, in a couple of different of the classes here uh, in the program at ECC. Um, you talk about it in, um, you know, in risk, we talk about risk aversion, and we talk about an organizational behavior. Um, there are some of the law classes that talk about it, but this idea is how much uncertainty um, is there in purchasing and buying the item? So are you going to go to, on a vacation to a place you've never been before? So what's that, you know, how risky is that? Are you going to buy a, you know, a pair of shoes that you've never worn before and, and you know, use them right away to, to um, you, know, are they, you know, sports shoes and you're going to 
play a big game in them? How much risk are you taking? And this idea of risk aversion, how, how um, you guys also talk about in finance too, how willing are you to make the investment in something that you do, you may or may not know about. Okay, so um, people handle risk in different ways. Basically, um, you, know, you can look at, there's a couple of different methods they look at, we look at here. One is gathering information. You know, everyone goes, now you can go online and look up what's going on. Um, a brand loyalty and brand image, store image. Well, you know, they sold it at Macy's, so it must be good quality. Um, and then uh, sometimes two people, you know, this idea of looking at um, the, the price. If it's, if it's a high price, it must be good, right? Some people think. Anyway, okay, doke. So we're finished. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. One more slide. My apologies. So uh, one thing, just think about maybe a recent purchase you've made that you've considered risky. Um, what kind of risk was it involved? Was it a price risk? Was it a quality risk? And um, how did you handle the risk? How did you think about that? You know, that's something, again, you can just think about to yourself. Um, you know, think about next time you buy something, you know, you're going you're gonna to switch toothpaste brands, that kind of thing. Okay, so thanks a million. Uh, we're wrapping up with chapter four, and we will see you back here at chapter five.